You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Because we're in C category prison, smashes it, goes over and stabs a guy, twists it in his face. This is a guy laying beaten, the thief. Pat picks him up, walks out to the landing, looks over the landing, drops him, hits the alarm bell, all the screws come out to the guy, the guy's, he didn't die, but he wasn't in a very well, so that's the way you do it boys, Pat went, no, it just drained out of me, you know, you think, shit, this is proper jail, you know, we was in a D category before, we're now in a C and I'm in with him, one of them cases you got, you got no DNA, there was, there was no guns, there was nothing, no motive, which is the main thing, no motive. There was nothing in this case. Why did they want those two so bad for it? Because of Court Nichols with drugs, dealing with police officers. You had police co- corruption. You had to cover it up. Mm-hmm. It, took, it took the numb off of that, you see. It took the numbness off of that. Them two police officers are obviously six years on full pay at home while this is all going on. Dad's been dead about nine years now, but he got cancer, never knew he had, and, you know, he was, time he was told he's got cancer, he was dead within two weeks. But he went to the jail to see Jack um, the week before he died and said to my brother, um, Jack, just admit it, get home and look after your mother. You know, just just admit it, you get out. And my brother said, I ain't admitting to something I've never done. You know, which was a, oh, Terrible emotional roller coaster for them both, mm-hmm. you know. But um, there's no way that Jack was going to admit for something he didn't do. When they got back, they cut it, edited it, and then you see on this video through a window of me sitting in the bar saying that Jack and Mick done it. No way would I ever come out of that t- statement, even after 25 fucking years, you know. But that parasite done that to me. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got John Holmes. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. No problem at all. Your brother Jack was convicted of the Essex Boy murders. He's just been released a few weeks ago. That's right, yep. How's things been? Yeah, great. He, Jack's home now. He's um he's home with me mum, um, which is Jack's always Jack's ambition to be home with me mum, to look after me mum, you know. She's now just survived the COVID stuff and she's eighty odd years old and she's got a boy home, which has been the main objective all the way through. Yeah. And that was twenty three years. Twenty four years ago. Twenty four yeah. years he yeah. spent in prison. Yeah. I always go back to the start of my guest, John, just to get a better understanding of yourself and yeah. we'll go right through everything. But we'll go back to where you grew up and how it all began. Yep. Yeah, we grew up in the East End of London. Um, normal kids in a normal street, you know. Dad was a motor mechanic. Um, we went to normal schools. We, obviously, we was only six, seven, eight years old then by the time. I think I was nine when we left London. But, you know, the, the early days, we were just normal kids in a normal street. How many's in your family at this time? Um, I... Uh, at then, at that time, while we lived in London, there was uh, four brothers and a sister. Who's the oldest? Uh, Terry, my oldest brother, Terry. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the youngest? Um, youngest one was my youngest brother, William. So you and Jack are in the middle? Yeah, me and Jack are in the middle, yeah. What was you and Jack like as kids? Were you close brothers? Yeah, we was close from, obviously, always been close from day one, you know. And if I can tell you the incident of when we was kids in London um, riding our little trike bikes we went off up the street as you do and then you know my little trike broke down allegedly you know you make it out as your kids and Jack come along and towed me home so you know saved me really and on my journey home the Coleman had delivered some coal my trike hit the wheel front wheel I'll go over and lump of coal goes in my head and scars my head 
And, you know, but, but Bless me. my brother Jack has come to my rescue. And obviously, later on in life, I have to return that favour. Yeah, and you've been trying to fight that favour for the last yeah, 10 have, odd yeah. years. How was your schooling? You and Jack, how, what's it, how many years are you apart, first of all? One year between me and Jack. So the twins, basically? Yeah. And yeah. he older? Jack's older than me, one year older, yeah. So the bigger brother, trying to protect his little brother all the time. Yeah. What was he like at school? Was he very protective then? Um, no, we all we all just got on with the school life, you know. We all went to normal schools, even when we moved up here to up to Suffolk. Um, just normal school life, no problems. We all left school, 16, when you could then. All went into jobs because we would all work, you know, and we wanted to go to work. None of us took any, you know, extra courses at school. We just wanted to go to work, which we did. How was it working? What age? Well, we originally, uh, me and myself, I started working about at 15 years old. I used to work for Artex Sealing Company, you know, before I actually left school and then actually went to work for them. Jack used to help me dad in the workshop because my dad was a motor mechanic and... Jack wanted to be a motor mechanic and, you know, he learned from my dad, so Jack was probably early on. Have you ever in any trouble at school? No, no, no trouble at school, no. So good kids, yeah, no bother, yeah. good, raised by a good family, hard-working yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, when we did, never had any problems at school. Uh, when did you start getting into trouble then? Um, when, we, when we moved up to Suffolk, um, obviously then Londoners wasn't accepted that well up in Suffolk, so we used to get a blame for a lot of stuff. You know, um, you know, a local parish magazine said Londoners moved to village because it was an unseen thing then. In the, it was late 60s when we moved. That's 69, I think it was. Um, but we never got into trouble. We had, you know, the normal things when you had your, your moped, your motorbikes and your first car. The local police used to stop you, but the old man made sure that all the indicators worked, your horn worked and all the things. So there's, you know, a few... Motor offences, they tried to get us on, but they never did get us on. What was the first time you went to prison? Did you and your brother get the jail together? Yeah, that was... that. Me and, me and my brother Jack, we went to jail um, for car ringing um, in, in the early 90s, 92, I think it was. Um, we changed the identity on a couple of cars and um, we got caught and decided, to, you know, we weren't going to talk to the police and... All the courts and went to jail. First offence, first criminal offence. Got 16 months. For a first offence? First offence. But then, you know, we chose not to... Not to operate. To, we chose not to... My dad brought us up. Yeah. You know, my dad, at East End of London, you don't talk to them people, say nothing, nothing will happen. And, you know, that was drummed into you and that's what we've done. But it wasn't the correct way to do it, as you learn later on in life. <laughs> when you were in that prison, that when you met Steel, Nichols and Tate... Yeah, when we got... Um, Steel, six, who was yeah, was Jack's co-accused? Yeah, that's right, yeah, Michael and Steel, yeah. Nichols was the supergrass. Yeah. And obviously Tate was the one who yeah. got murdered. So you were all in the same prison then, the yeah. early 90s? Yeah, we, 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 me and Jack first went to Norwich and then we went on to Hosley Bay where we met Steel, Tate, Nichols, you know, all to do with the case. Um, nice enough guys, you know, everyone was in there doing a... Their own sentences, really. And who was it then? Did you become good friends, everyone? Um, me and Pat got um, shipped out of Hosley Bay. Um, Jack didn't know Pat because we was only in there a few, two months and me and Pat got shipped out of there, out of um, Hosley Bay. We went to High Point Prison. Um, Jack stayed at Hosley Bay, Mick Steele was still at Hosley Bay and Nichols was still at Hosley Bay. So I'd been removed and Pat had been removed. So so Jack obviously got to know Mick Steele, engineer, same thing as Jack, you know. Same trade. Same trade. Um, Nichols was in for currency fraud, I think, for printing money. And, you know, we all done our sentences and come out. I got shipped to High Point with Pat. And, you know, some weird, strange things went on there. <laughs> but What kind of stuff? Well, um, Pat was like royalty in the jail, you know, because he's obviously been on the stretch before and he was five years into the one he was in when we got shipped there. Um, 
and he he actually there was a, a thief within the um, prison which you don't have in a prison and the the uh, prison unit itself said we've got to find the the thief who's thieving from the cells so they designated me and Pat to search everyone's cells while everyone stayed in the um, a room so we went round and done that me and Pat not the thing you want to be doing couldn't find nothing and then a couple of days later um, one of the young lads said it's my mate who's doing the stealing so someone grasped up on someone and it was a young guy um, who was always on the phone and everything. And he um, had stolen f from the cells. When we come back from lunch one day, a couple of the guys had beat him up in the corridor outside me and Pat's room. And as we walked back from dinner, Pat then um, come up the stairs and this guy lays there beaten by other inmates. So Pat said, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? And uh, I said, well, he's a thief and blah, blah. But he said, no, Pat went, no, that ain't how you do it. I think it's how you do it. So Pat comes into our room. I'm sitting on the bed like where you are, away from me. Picks up a red sauce bottle, which we had on our windowsill, which, you know, we had for our food. Because we was in C category prison. Smashes it. Goes over and stabs a guy. Twists it in his face. This is a guy laying beaten, the thief. Pat picks him up, walks out to the landing, looks over the landing, drops him, hits the alarm bell. All the screws come out to the guy. The guy's, he didn't die, but he wasn't in a very well. So that's the way you do it, boys, Pat went. No, it just drained out of me. You know, you think, shit, this is proper jail. You know, we was in a D category before, we're now in a C and I'm in with him. Were you scared of him? Um, he was a very powerful man. He filled the doorways, 20 stone steroid up monster, but he was, he was like a father to me in there, Pat was. You know, when he left, he paid his way out of the jail because he knew some of the SOs in the prison and he paid some money up front and got shipped to another open prison within two months. Um... But once Pat had gone, I was looked after like a lord. You know, I was being brought food late at night. There were some Turkish guys doing, you know, curry and keeping it warm on the radio, and they'd turn up with it, and I used to say to them, you know, I'll get you some tobacco or something, you know, from my private spends, because I never smoked or nothing. And they said, no, 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 Pat. Pat said, you've got to be looked after while you was here. And I was. Lovely guy to me, Pat was, you know, smashing guy. He used to kick off with his wife like most people did, you know, but if she didn't come and visit or something like that, the normal things, but but he was heavily into the drugs in the jail. and But he never served up out of our room, you know. I'm, I'm an anti-drug person anyway, and I was never going to go down that avenue, but he respected that, Pat did. What sort of drugs was Pat taking inside? Oh, he had everything from cannabis to heroin, LSD... You know, I've seen, I used to walk down the corridor and there'd be eight of them in the room and they'd be injecting with a needle that, you know, when it pushed against your skin, it, it was a job for them to get it in because eight or ten of them had used it or been used prior. But ever on come downs or anything, especially when in prison? I think the, the, the story to come down, yeah, you're going to get that. But one of the things, when Pad left the jail... And an SO, I used to work out the jail, so I was an outworker. And one of the SOs who Pat knew really well come across to me and um, said, are you getting on, John, all right? I said, yeah, 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 fine. And uh, I said, Dad, how did you know Pat? He said, oh, he's been here before. He said, but Pat makes our job easy. I said, but I had to work that out then. So he says, he come here, fill the jail with drugs. He said, they'll all be calm. He said, our job's easy. They thought he was a smashing guy. They thought that was normal. What did you do when you got out of prison? When I come out of prison, went back to a normal job, same as Jack, you know. We'd done our time, come out, went back to normal jobs. I was a builder at the time, doing the building industry. And we just all carried on, you know. We never never lost our jobs because we went to jail. Um, you know, we just fitted straight back in where we was. 
it was easy to get out of jail and go back into work? Did you ever think about going back into crime straight away? No, I think then, you know, you, you, as, as the judge says, when he put us in the jail, you know, you need a short, sharp shock. Um, short, sharp shock. Shock right? treatment, yeah, back in the day. Yeah, definitely. Was that tough? I've had a few men on the show and they speak about that, how oh. hard it was. Yeah, it's, it is hard in there. You know, you do see some horrific things and you see some young lads come in and, you know, they're fed drugs and they come out evil monsters out of them places, you know? It is hard and even harder today, I should imagine, but it's a hard thing to do to take over your liberties taken away. And what was Jack's like, life like when he got out? Yeah, he went back into his job. You know, his job was waiting the same. So he'd done his job and, you know, we carried on as normal. He, he was obviously friends with Mick Steele then and, you know, because they had engineering. Um, they're very similar people, really, in engineering. You know, they engineer stuff and... And Mick was older. He's over 20 years old, is that Yeah, correct? yeah, Mick's older, yeah. Mick's a lovely guy. Lovely guy, you know. I met him afterwards myself, you know, a couple of times, you know. And we'd have been out and had beer and, you know, barbecuing that. And What's the helicopter incident? Oh, the helicopter incident is, um, is that, is that the, what, well, there was a couple of incidents, is that was at the... Chelmsford, uh, Chelmsford. Oh, at Chelmsford, yeah. When um, Jack and Mick obviously got arrested for the um, importation of drugs um, with Nichols, obviously um, they was then taken to police station, to police station, to police station, and then they um, was taken to Chelmsford to be... Um, remanded in a proper prison. So on the way there, they was in these um, armoured vehicles, three or four armoured vehicles in front, three or four armoured vehicles behind, going through Chelmsford. As I was going through Chelmsford, the crew on the ground, the police on the ground, hadn't told the chopper of where the um, convoy was going. So it turned off its track. The helicopter landed instantly in the park at Chelmsford, just come straight to the ground, and all these armed men jumped out of the helicopter because they wanted to know why this has happened. You know, and you'd never seen anything like it. And I'm, I was at the magistrate court that day thinking, whatever's going on here, you know, you've got armed officers laying in the road, you know, with armed safety catchers on incredible and then they bring Jack and Mick along you know with all these armoured vehicles how long did that trial last was it six months well that was that was a that was the um, magistrate's court one that was um, so they was remanded in custody um, that that was only a day that one was but then um, on that incident there um, y you know all the fam all the families was there well not all of my family, I was there, um, you know, Steele's family was there and all the rest of it. And then you know that they're then, they, it was then they got charged with the murders as well at the Magistrate's Court at Chelmsford. As so well they as weren't just charged with the Importation, they were charged with the murder. With um, Tony Tucker, Patty yeah. and Craig, yeah. what's his second name, Rolf? Craig Rolf, Rolf. yeah. Um, is that when Nichols turned Supergrass? Y yeah, well... Nick, what actually happened with Nichols, um, Nichols got caught going back into um, Braintree where he lived. Um, he was driving along with a friend of his behind in a car. They had 10 kilos of cannabis with him. Um, they got stopped by Essex Police um, Unit. Um, and when they got stopped on the side of the road, they said to Nichols, what you got in your car? Search his car. Nothing in his car, but the guy behind, I think his name was Colin Bridge. I'm sure it is now. Yeah, it is Colin. Um, he had 10 kilos in the van. Um, but So Nichols gets out and says, look, I'm with you guys. I'm working with you guys. Nichols was actually working with the Essex police. But the officers that stopped him said, sorry, we're South East Regional Crime Squad. We're watching you and the police. So Nichols thought he was bulletproof because he was working with two police officers. He was, but he was, he was selling drugs. Nichols telling the police where he was selling the drugs. The police was going nicking them. 
getting the money, getting the drugs, giving the drugs back to Nichols, keeping the money, the officers. Nichols sold the drugs. Lovely little circle. Round and round it goes. And then obviously an outside force like the South East Regional Crime Squad look at that and think, hang on, we'll watch these officers. And that's what they found. And then, of course, once Nichols then gets in custody and the two police officers in mind, they're in custody as well, they get taken into custody, Nichols has got to get himself out. So he starts singing like a canary. Yeah. So when your brother Jack and Mick are in, what were they expecting for the drugs charges? Um, they a few years, five. Yeah, to they ten. would have got. They would have got a few years for it, um, like anyone would have done. But we knew from the beginning um, what Nichols was coming out with wasn't true. So when did he? What was it like then for your brother when? Was it a chap at the cell to, to get the, the other charge of three murders? Was it because he was still in prison to say, look, you're being charged with these three murders? That, that was done at that magistrate's court, you so know. So they'd done it at the court? Yeah. That, what was going through Jack's mind then? It, well, everything, because obviously they brought Nichols there as well, you know, to mm-hmm. to um, go against his fellow mates, you know, but Nichols had no choice. He'd been dealing with police officers. That, that, that was a mess, you know. You got... Police officers being arrested, Jack, Mick, Nichols, others being arrested. It was just a mess. So something had to something had to give. And obviously they'd had Nichols for six or seven days. Nichols made twenty eight statements in that time before he got a, a statement mm-hmm. what he thought was right. So the murders happen, they get charged with drugs, they're in remand. And then they get charged for the murders while yeah. in prison. When when they was getting remanded mm-hmm. for the drugs, they then put the murders on them that day in Chelmsford. So they was charged. I was there when they done it. And what was Nichols? He was. What did he end up getting out? He he, 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 he then become a super grass. Yeah. So he could get a new identity. Mm-hmm. Him and his family um, got moved instantly. He had the choice to do that. How long was the murders after it done for when they get charged? Six months. I think the murders happened in December. Yeah, December ninety five. Yeah, and Jack and Mick was charged in the May. And they had nothing to do with it. No, there was nothing. There was so no. what evidence did they have when they went to court? Because I know there was Nichols. no DNA. Ev- uh, yeah, just Nichols because there was no DNA, no ev- no, no there forensics. Was, it, 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 the, the trouble with it, and I preached on about it for years because one of them cases you got you got no DNA. There was there was no guns. There was nothing, no motive, which is the main thing, no motive. There was nothing in this case. The only thing they had was Nichols. And then, obviously, Nichols, we had an Old Bailey trial of six months. So Nichols had to come and give evidence in there for two weeks, given his evidence, in which he got tore to bits in there by a legal team. So what evidence stuck for them to get Layford? Through the six-month trial, trial lasted for six months, mm-hmm. and the judge summed up for, I think it was about 16 days, the judge, judge summed up. There was telephone evidence for mobile telephone evidence, it's the early days of mobile telephones, that backed up some of Nichols's story, you know, but the, we knew that the evidence was doctored, been played around with. So we knew what we was up against. So we knew we walked that trial. We knew it because we could rip it to bits. And the legal team we had, which was fantastic, you know, we we, we knew that, but it didn't go that way. And, and after the six month trial, the jury turned round to the not the jury, the judge, the judge turns round to the jury, and he's because his judge's final words of his sixteen days summing up, he says, "Heed my advice. If you believe this guy Nichols, convict. If you don't believe him, acquit." So that was the only evidence. After 16 days of summing up, you could tell the judge that he's thinking that this guy's a liar or he ain't. So he's telling the jury to do that. He's telling the jury to do that. So one man's evidence is enough to convict? Yeah. So even though he was caught with them for drugs, he'd been in prison with them before, he stood there, became a super grass, started pointing the fingers, and that was enough to put two men behind bars for life? For life, yep. What was Jack thinking when he got found guilty? Poor, devastated, obviously, like the rest of the family. 
devastated. But he, on the way through the trial, there was an incident in a trial. Um, Jack was about to give his evidence in the box in, at the Old Bailey. Obviously, from our previous um, journey to jail, we realised it's don't pay not to talk. So Jack takes the box in the Old Bailey. So we're sitting in the Old Bailey. You've got a protected jury underneath. No one sees him jury, only Jack Mick Nichols in the court. So that's protected. Jack goes to take the stand in the box. As he goes to stand in the box, there was eight armed police comes in the public gallery, where we're sitting in the public gallery. I wasn't there that day. And they arrest my mother, who was then 60-odd years old, and my younger brother, and take him off to Snow Hill Police Station, just as Jack was going to give his evidence. So there's obviously a big commotion in the court. The next day, our legals asked, what is this reason, because they've still been held. And they said that my mum, who was 60-odd years old, tried to get to the jury on St Paul's train station. Now, bearing in mind we're sitting in the public gallery, or they was at that, that day, we can't see the jury. The jury don't know who Mrs. Wombs is or her other son, or did they? We don't know this, you see? So they've arrested them, and they said that they was trying to get to them on the tube station. Well, the following day, I went to get the CCTV from British Transport Police uh, from St Paul's. It's already gone. We never got access to that. We wasn't given that. There was no attempt. That was to rock Jack in the box. You see, but Jack still give his evidence in the box. And my mum was then banned. This was halfway through the trial of a two-mile exclusion zone. My mum and my younger brother from going to the Old Bailey. Where was Jack when the murders happened? When the murders happened? Yeah. Jack was in a... Um, he was about a mile away from the scene. I don't know whether that's the time of the murders because there's conflict in times. You know, there's... Um, you know, the, the time of the murders, they say, was 7 o'clock, but there's obviously other things that point to later and early hours of the morning. And Did they not have an alibi or anything? Or, or yeah, Jack had an alibi, yeah. Or other witnesses to say he was with them? Yeah, Nichols asked him on the morning of the uh, 6th of December. Um, Nichols' car had broken down in the vicinity of um, Retterton um, and said to Jack, will you go and pick my car up? My car's broke down. So Jack said, I can't do it now, Darren. I'll do it later on. So Jack goes later on, takes a trailer and a thing, and goes and picks up, and it was in a pub car park. Jack gets there, picks the car up, rings, Nick, rings Darren up, so I've got your car, Darren. It's on the back, I'll take it back to my yard. Darren said, just get rid of it. Get rid of it, Jack. He said, it's fucked, it's broke. You know, so Jack takes it back to the yard, and it would just run out of transmission, or it was automatic, so it wouldn't drive. Jack puts an oil in it. He was going to take it and scrap it, but he didn't. So he just sold it to one of the travellers that come in, one of the guys come in and said, yeah, take it away. How connected to Tate, Tucker and Rolf was um, Nichols? Was there any connection? Uh, Nichols to Pat, yeah. Uh, Nichols kept in contact because with Because of the Pat. prison days? Yeah, because of prison days and the drug dealing. Mm. You know, obviously Nichols was drug dealing and there was a connection to Pat. So when Jack got found guilty, all the evidence, no evidence against him, what do you think was it? Mass police corruption, or yeah. mass, yeah, or just a, one of those ones that was a miscarriage of justice. They actually thought it was him, or was it a just blatant setup? I used to, I used to, because once Jack got uh, weighed off at the trial, obviously they got three life sentences to do a minimum of fifteen years, and when you listen to that, three life sentences, do a minimum of fifteen years. Yeah, that's it's, lenient. It's lenient. You got it. It's mm -hmm. lenient. So why did the judge do that? Because he knew that. He knew he that judge. It. Yeah, he knew that judge. Why would he do that? So Give why did they end up serving 24? What happened? Because um, they got 15 years, that was when their first date of parole, they would have been allowed to go for parole. Jack Straw, at the time, the Home Secretary, changed all lifers to life. So Jack Mick and all other lifers go to 25 years. Someone within the, the jail system, another inmate, challenged it in the European Court of Law, won it, so the Home Secretary at the time had to re-tariff everyone back. So they put Jack and Mick at 25 years. Mick then got three years off because of his, he, he appealed against it. 
Jack didn't bother because they're going to be sitting there for 20 odd years and just didn't. Did they ever offer him a deal to admit it and get let out earlier? Yeah, so, so Mick Steele's tariff become lower. Um, Jack stayed at where it was and later on in the sentence, Jack got his reduced. By two years? Yeah, by two years, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was going through your mind, Mick's family's mind, your family's oh. mind when that happened? Did you think it was just a, a bad dream? Yeah, you. when you woke up, this, this is a strange, when you woke up with a night, you know, Jack's been weighed off, life sentence, and, you know, you're on every radio station, every TV programme, every newspaper, daily. And you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet and you think, what's Jack doing now? You know? You can get up and go to the toilet, you can get up and do this, make yourself a cup of tea or whatever. You know, that's what used to go for my head. You know, this is wrong. And we could see, and I could see what they'd done. You know, they, the, 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 the don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-establishment, but there's good and bad coppers. But there's quite a few bad ones in this crew, you know. Did you feel as if they had a lot of pressure on them, the police, to get a conviction? Yes, 100%. Because I had Joe Steele and TC Campbell on my show two years ago, two men who served over 20 years in prison for the ice cream wars in Glasgow. Police corruption again. Mm. Listen, there's good and bad cops. There's like anything you do yeah. in life, but they got their conviction overturned after 20 years. Yeah. No evidence. Yeah. People don't realise that this stuff happens. It happens a lot more frequently than people think. It does, yeah. So when you were, because you've always fought for your brother's freedom, you've always you've always done protests. What sort of protests were you doing? Um, wait, once Jack got weighed off and I, I took it on myself, well, I ain't having this. I'm not having this, you know. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protest. I'm going to highlight this case and I'll keep this case highlighted. And I took it on board. Um, I didn't see anything else. That was my direction in life. Me work, me family, me home, me, me own family at the time. You know, they all got pushed to the side. That was my focus. I'm going to highlight. I'm going to make this a high-profile case. It was already high-profile. I'll make it even bigger. You know, I'll take this to the rafters. So straight away, instantly, when those two police officers, after about six years, come up for um, an internal inquiry. I thought, no, I ain't having that. Why should them cunts have that an internal inquiry? So I thought, no, I'll stop that. So I planned the gantry, the M25. So I climbed the gantry just before the Dartford Bridge gets up there, and I put on one side. Jack Wombs, Mike was still innocent of the Range Rover murders. On the other side, the main side, when you see the traffic coming towards you, the side of the road I was on, corrupt police hearing behind closed doors. So I get something at Gantry at seven o'clock in the morning, climbs up there. When I get up there, half past seven, the sun on the next bridge taking photographs. That was organised by someone else. So by the end of that day, I was on every radio station, I was in every newspaper the next day, and I was on every TV programme that night. And I stayed up there for eight hours. And I had police down there. All the stunts in the world was pulled on me up there while I was up there. Like what? There was a car that sat about a mile away. And it sat there on the side of the road. And the guy would get out, a police officer, you see, because the first, let me, the first thing, the first thing, a copper pulls up, normal copper, and he says, uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I have your number? Can I give, have your number? So I said, no, because you'll cut my phone off. So he said, John, just give it, we'll have communication, because they couldn't come up, because I'd roped all the ladder off, so they couldn't get up there. So I'm, I'm up there. They've stopped the M25 at this stage, completely shut it, because of this incident. So this guy's going, give me your number, John, give me your number. So I said, no, no, no. And I thought, no, I'll have the communication. So I'll give me a number. At the time, my number ended in 222. I'll give him 333 on the end of my normal number. So within 10 minutes... My phone rings. So I said, we better stop fucking lying now, haven't we? Because I've just given you the wrong number. So you already have my number. Okay, John, okay, John. He's going. So he said, what's your aim? I said, I'm going to sit up here. I've got my lunch. And if I've stayed all night, stay all night. I want our solicitor, Chris Bowen, 
in that hearing at Chelmsford Police HQ to see these two officers that was drug dealing with Nichols. There's disciplinary hearing. Our that should be there. I want Jack Straw to know that I'm up here. That's my request. Then I'll come down. And they said, give us some time, John. With that, they've um, come back about a half hour later and they said, John, Jack Straw knows, which it would have done. I was on every radio station, like I say, TV, you know, there masses of TV people there. And he said, um, but your slizzard can't go into that hearing. So I said, well, don't fucking come down then. So he says that, you know. So I stayed up there for eight hours. Um, and then there was this guy in the distance, what I was going to tell you about, in a car, a long way up. And this is the guy communicating with me on the phone. So he gets out of the car and he's talking away to me. I'm walking about on the gantry talking to this copper. He's a um, trained negotiator. So he's talking to me in the car. Standing out the car, walking around and around the car, talking to me. I'm just just about seeing him in distance. So I'm talking away to him on, on my phone, like this. And as I'm talking to him, he's trying to get me down, you see. So I click him off. I cut him off, you see. I've still got my phone to me here. So has he. He ain't took his phone away and thinking, oh, I dial him again. So it was a guy in the car who was a negotiator. This guy was a dummy. And I'm thinking, why is this? Then there was a van sit there. It said red alert on the side. A transit van, all black deck windows, red van, phone box red. Sat there the whole time. I think, who are they? So anyway, so I sit there the eight hours. I'm up there. And then this guy who was in the car, who I've worked out now, rings me up and says, John, um, you are on every radio station. You're on every TV programme. Jack Straw knows this. You're massive all over the media. He said, the tailback is back to the A12, over eight miles, eight or nine miles. He said, there hasn't been any incidents. He said, there's been no bumper to bumper. There's been no one hurt so far, John, today. He said, I'm asking you to come down before someone gets hurt. He fucked me. Yeah, that's first point, isn't it? Fuck me. So come and get me. So then they had to send a special unit up and the rest of it. But when they come up on the gantry, and I was on the gantry, I would, my feet was chained, one of my feet was chained to two 415 power cables up there. And they went, where's the key, John, to that? I said, uh, in Suffolk. So they had to go away, get bolt coppers, and they, they took the, them chains off of me without touching me. Explained to me how to get down the ladder. I'm a builder at the time, I know how to get down, but all health and safety dealt with properly. In the car, get in here, put the seat belt on me, never even touched me, put it in, boom. Nice going up the M25 the wrong way, you know, because it was shut. Off to Grace Police Station, bang me up. Yeah, but we'd have done that if there wasn't um, press and that, and there are people seen that. Oh, yeah, you know 100%. I mean? Yeah, they'd they, they, kick the fuck out you if the, no one yeah. was there. And the woman, the woman sergeant in the car um, going back, and that, they was talking about, you know, I was saying about police, and they said, well, it's good and it's bad, John, yeah, and the rest of it going on in the car. Got me back to the station and then searched me. I had a big yellow coat on with Jack, Free Jack and Mick and all the rest yeah. of it on. They searched me. So you through the trial, John. There was a guy called Billy Fisher. Eh, uh, Billy. There's a guy called Billy Jasper. Yeah. Billy Jasper gave evidence to say that um, he was paid. That's right. But there was a phone call as well to yeah. the person who had done the murder, but it wasn't used in, as evidence. Why is that? The Billy Jasper, uh, Billy Jasper, and um, Gal was called to the old Bailey to give evidence. They were both called there because they'd obviously admitted, I think it was a January, after the murders, that they'd done it for someone in the East End or something, and they uh, said the route they went into the lane, um, and they was paid five grand, I think it was at the time. But when they was got into the box, because obviously they was both in prison at the time, they was warned that they could end up with a murder charge on them. So basically the police had got to them, and they was retracted out of there. But if somebody's admitted it, then why is it not being used as evidence? 
They wanted they, they, they wanted Jack and Mick for it. Why did they want those two so bad for it? Because of Colt Nichols with drugs dealing with police officers. You had police co- corruption. You had to cover it up. Mm-hmm. It took it took the number for of that. You see, it took the numbness off of that. Them two police officers are obviously six years on full pay at home. While this is all going on, is that the main reason why you think they've been convicted for it? I, I, I think that they had to get Nichols um, to do 28 statements. They had to get Nichols right. And, you know, we could hear what they'd done with him. You could hear on his tapes what they'd done with him. You know, to get that right. And they they went in with that chance at the Bailey. When they got the lifer, did you ever think they would get an appeal easily? That they would be out in a few years because there's nothing against them? Did you realise it would go as far as it did? I knew, I knew straight away, I thought, well, we're going to go for an appeal and we're going to get this because we're going to tear this to shreds, you know. But you don't you don't realise how um, corrupt and how big the case was. And, of course, the fact then, you know, I started protesting, I'm making it higher profile. What did you do with the body, a, a body and a trolley? Yeah, I went, to, um, after the gantry, I'd done the... Um, uh, Crown Prosecution Service. No, this was the after the gantry. I'd done the Home Office. I took a, a fake body on a trolley, you know, a hospital trolley, pushed it down the road, covered up, you know, it's just a dummy. Um, out to go, I was going to go in the Home Office in London with it um, as a publicity stunt to create more about the case for no time of death, because obviously Tate Tuck and Rolf was never given the time of death. They decided, they knew how they died, there's no point in doing the time of death. Why is that? Because it would give a different time. Mm-hmm. To who was there at the area? It would give a, it, mm-hmm. They would have come up with a different time, you know. See, the forensics, would they would have, if, if it was two people who had done the shootings, would it not have been shot at different heights as well? If you know what I mean, like the forensics, if somebody gets shot in the head, shot in the head and... Some people say it was two people who'd done it, some people say it was one. If it was one, then they would have been shot at a different level, the same level, but if it was two, it would have been different levels. Did the forensics not do any if, of that if, stuff? If, if you see the murder photographs, which you know I, I, I've seen, um, it's so professional and so clean. You know, there's not a lot of mess in that motor. You know, you see photographs, you know, when the bodies are out, there's obviously a lot of blood in there then, but when they're sitting in the situ, it's just precision. You know, that's a that's a proper marksman. That's yeah, a mili- military style, that mm-hmm. is. How was Mick going through his trial? Because he was a bit older. Was yeah, the, Was there yeah. people fighting his corner as well, family members, friends, trying th- to get a retrial? Yeah, I think, uh, obviously, Jack and Mick then went into over, uh, overtime and, you know, sat and went through their case and scrutinised it and, you know, was coming up with all the things that they'd done to us which had done so much to us. How hard has it been as well with all the films and all the books being out, bringing it back? Cause it's, it's, it's like it's never ending. It's like there's more eyes on it now, more people talking about it now than there was 25 years ago. How hard was that for the family to see it all plastered over online? To begin with, to begin with, you, it, um, my ambition was to keep it highlighted. So when the books started coming out in the films, I, I used to say to the people that are doing it, do it properly. You know, let's, let's, let's do it properly. Don't fake it or nothing like that. But y- you get a producer or something and he's going to do it his way and that's the way he's going to do it. You know, it's like any interview you do on the telly, the news or anything else. They're doing it their way, not your way. And that's what I had to learn. I had to learn... One, to be interviewed, and two, to learn to talk to them people. To begin with, I used to say, police, 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 police done this, police done that, police done that. I never got on the telly. Then I changed it. The authorities done this, the authorities done that, the authorities done that. I took the word police out, boom, I'm on the telly. Ah, now I'm learning. I'm on my way. How hard has it been for you? There was a lot of tears, John. Yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah. And yeah. did... Um, Mick or Jack ever feel that like ending a life in prison? Or they, always they always knew that they'll come out on an appeal. You know, mm. there was so much, so much wrong with it. 
It was so much fun. I don't know, you know, you never hear from Jack and Mick how they dealt with it within themselves in their own minds in the prison, but I know from my family what it done to my family, you know. We was a close, very close-knit family, and, you know, it just ripped it apart. Did then any of your family ever involved in crimes like that before? No. Murder, just all no. robberies? The only ones is me and Jack with yeah. a bit of car ringing. Mm -hmm. you know? So there was no previous uh, Jack no. shooting people before, no. nothing like that? No. I had um, Steve. If there would have been, Essex Police would have found it. Yeah. Yeah. Essex Police spent months and months and months up in Suffolk mm -hmm. interviewing people that we knew, Jack knew, I knew, we, trying to find out shit on the family. Mm -hmm. But there was no shit. We were just a normal family. Do you know who done the Essex Boys murders? Do I know who done it? Yeah. I would say it's got to be police or military style. Because I had Steve Ellison who says it was his dad. Yeah. This one's now come to light. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel about that? I was a bit angry about Nipper to begin with because I've known Nipper a lot of years. Lovely, lovely guy. Um, took me seven years to find him, mind, after Jack's case because I knew that he was the one that, you know, allegedly meant to have shot Pat and he was heavily involved. I needed to find him. Met him, lovely guy. Um, and we've been in contact on and off over the years and then of late to come out with what his dad told him. Um, I was a bit angry, but then if my dad told me the same, you know, you've got to, I've lost my dad the same as Nipper, you know. See him? Yeah, Jack lost his dad while he was in prison. Yeah, see him, like he my dad went. Yeah, so, and I, and I respect, you know, I, was, I, I, I messaged him straight away and I said, Nick, why don't you tell me? He said, John, my dad, I understand it. People say to me now, John, Nick has come out of his dad, what do you reckon? Nick has talked about his dad doing it. His evidence has not changed from 20 years ago when he was the second person arrested. Nick, um, uh, nippers nippers talking to people like it's just like it's spoken to you hasn't changed so he hasn't got a copy of his statement if he can remember that up here that guy's not lying I believe there's a lot in what's coming out there and how does that make you feel that your brother's and his friends in prison for life for somebody else's murder still throws me anger towards the, the establishment, you know. Um, we're, tw we're 25 years on now, you know. It, my, my anger is the establishment. It's not, it's, you know, the, the truth is going to come out, you know. You've got officers turning around there, Essex police officers. You've got the original officer that arrested Nichols turning around, you know. And there's more, so I've heard. What about anger, whistleblowers? Angle to, anger towards Nipper or his dad? No, I've got no, you know... I, if it was true. He, he's dealt with it He's dealt with it his way. And uh, I'm too old now. In the earlier days, I would have done another protest or something, you know, but mm. uh, Jack's home now. He's with his mum. Yeah, because a lot of people will question it. Why, why now say that statement? Is yeah. it because Jack's out now? Is it because... Maybe they're trying to get money for it, which is rightly so, but why make the statement now and not five years ago, ten years ago? Um, so it can be a difficult one for people looking from the outside. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. I can see that people thinking, you know, is he bullshitting or is he not? Right. Um, but I don't think it's bullshit. There's, 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 there's too much in his... Too much pain in his eyes. Yeah, you can't you can't pick it to bits what he's saying. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I'm I'm especially picked this case inside out to bits over the years, mm -hmm. and you can't pick his what he's saying to bits. So why can't they use that in court? Again, what? Why wouldn't they, though? Why why would they? If they take that back to court, they're straight away admitting Jack and Mick. They're innocent. Yeah, they ain't gonna go near this story. You know, this this story is going to be dissolved in an appeal court. You know, it's with the CCRC at the minute. That will get referred back. That will be resolved in a court of law. Jack and Mick's name will be cleared. What about um, 
the Sun newspaper you were in, you done a, an article three weeks ago. Yeah. Just came through some stuff. I think a lot of investigators come through and, yeah. and done the case and basically says, look, those guys never done those murders. Yeah, there's three police officers yeah. to do with the case. They're, you know, I think they're called TMI or something like that. Um, they've got videos online. Um, same, similar question to what you asked me. Why now? Why have they come, this is an officer that arrests Nichols and other officers to do with the case. Why come now? Why not come? You know, I'm not saying all police are bad. I have a police officer who rings me every year. He lives in Spain. How's Jack? Lovely, lovely guy. He used to come water skiing with us, everything. Lovely man. He was our local sergeant where we lived up in Suffolk. So there's good and there's bad. And you've got to ask yourself, these guys now that come forward, yes, they're helping the legal teams, blah, 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 but why now? Do you think you'll ever get closure on it for Jack, yeah. Mick, yourself? The closure will come. How hard have you been fighting over the last few years? Does it get tiresome? Um, I, I think really, going back to my la one of my last stunts um, at the High Court, we had an appeal in 2006... Um, and when we had this appeal, um, the Daily Mail newspaper at the time took us on board, got my whole family to keep them to themselves, took us to the hotel. We sat in this appeal hearing. Um, and then at this appeal hearing, we had so many points because the Supergrass in the case, Nichols, had written a book and we found out the book. He'd been paid money. And we had this appeal and we proved it in the appeal court. So we knew we'd won. But the judge deferred the judgment for a month. Why is that? Because he needed to sit back. Three judges in the um, appeal, court. appeal court. Sit back, di diagnose it and come up with um, what they're going to do. Or obviously be told what they're going to do. Who was what I used to think at the time. And they, they obviously deferred it for a month. Um, come to the day of the appeal... You know, you're going back to a highest court in the land, family all taken there, but the Daily Mail looked after perfectly. And we're in a hotel the night before, so we're sitting in this hotel, sitting in the bar. I goes up to the room to go to the toilet, because you don't normally like using the hotel toilets if you've got your own room, do you? So you go, you think there's your sentry? So you go, I go up to my room, my phone's on the side and it's ringing. So I fix the phone up. It's a woman from the, a reporter from the Daily Mirror. She says, John, I want your first opinion on where Jack's lost the appeal tomorrow. I think, who is this woman? Who is this woman? You know? And I know someone very high up in the Daily Mirror. Um, and I thought, I'll ring him because he's been a godsend all while I've been protesting. And his ears at the top of the mirror. So I rings him up and I says, his phone is goes through to a... Um, Abroad tone. So I know he's abroad. Rings him up. He says, John, I'm on this. I said, yeah, just one thing. I said, one of your silly girls just rung me up and asked me about the appeal tomorrow. Give me, give me 10 minutes. He rings me back. He's in uh, Tenerife. He rings me back. He says, John, that's right. You've lost your appeal tomorrow. I'm thinking, are they right or are they not? Can they be right? So I thought the next morning, I've got to tell my mother. So I goes next morning, we're going to court to tell me, mother, she's going, no, 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 no. I told the legal team, no, 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 no. Tell the barristers, the QCs, everything we got there. No, 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 no. We won it. We could tell we'd won it. Then you see the Essex police come in the court for the answers. They're full uniform now with their superintendent and all his full uniform, all got smiles from here to here on their face. Judge comes out. Yes, there was a problem here with Nichols, blah, blah, with officers, but not these officers. The appeal's gone. How did that fucking girl know? How did that girl know? 2011, that was 2006. In 2011, the phone hacking come out. Them judges must have been hacked. It's the only way. Three high court judges was never going to tell a silly daily mirror, mirror reporter. Mm -hmm. So they had the information? They had the information. They was right. Mm -hmm. Would, um, but it haunted me. It haunted me bad. Yeah.
because you're paranoia can play a massive mm. part in all this as well and then mm. before you know it destroys your mental health and yeah it's hard especially if you know your brother's innocent and, yeah. and that's all you're fighting for would jack do a polygraph test yeah 100 percent he would do yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. how did, were they treated in prison with the three murders jack and mick yeah, fine. You know, he went for his sentence. You know, obviously there was they had their problems within the jail. You know, which happens in every jail. There was a problem with you know, they was making bacon sandwiches, and you can't have bacon in the jail now. Um, you know, that's been banned because the Muslims don't like it. So there was a problem there, and there's obviously a few fights, and Jack and Mick both got injured badly. Um, just the normal things, you know, what happens within a jail. How's Jack? F f he's coming out to COVID and the lockdown. How's, yeah. It's not as if much has really changed then. It's, um, he can't yeah. get out. How was he his very first day out after spending over 20 years in prison? He he went straight to my mum's and, you know, he, he'd been working out of a prison anyway, so... Yeah, home leaves. Yeah, he's had home leaves, so mm -hmm. he was just... Um, he carried, you know, Jack will carry on fighting his case now. My job's done. Jack will carry on fighting now with his legal team, you know, so he's at home, he can sit there in his own comfort and go for it all at his own pace and not have the pressures of, you know, having your light turned off or you can't do this or you can't do that. How do you think he'll adapt now that he's out for good? He'll adapt to Coco, okay, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. He's, he's, he's strong, you see, because... Uh, he's still young as well. He's only in his fifties. Look, Max in his seventies. It's a different yeah, ball Jack, game as well. Yeah, Jack, Jack's now now sixty. So yeah, he's he's still you know he's he's still relatively young, I suppose, same as me, mm -hmm. sort of thing. But um, he'll just get on. That's what we do. Yeah, just got to push on. So where do you go from here, John? Um, the steps? It, it'll go back. Obviously, the Criminal Case Review Commission's got it. Um, and they've got it, and that will be referred back to the Court of Appeal. Um, and that one, I reckon, will win. And what happens there then? Because this will be one of the biggest miscarriages of justice ever she, in the UK has ever seen that. This goes deep then. Do, yeah. they, do, do they want this to get thrown out or change the conviction because the shit then that will be questioned will be unbelievable? The, 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 I reckon probably what they'll do at the end, they'll probably let it, let it get overturned with a technicality of something we've come up with or the lawyers, not we, the lawyers have come up with. Um, and I, f I reckon that that will get, um, that will definitely get overturned, but what they'll say then is, the question will be asked, are the Essex Force looking for anyone else? And the answer will be, due to the passage of time, we're not looking for nobody else. In other words, we think Jack and Mick are still guilty, they ain't got to answer the question, have they? Mm -hmm. They do it with all the cases. Has any of the police ever came forward and says to you, look, we don't think it's them after the case, after their conviction? Only the ones that are coming out of the woodwork now? They came forward before? No, not before, no. Oh, just the ones that are speaking out the now? ones that are speaking out now. Why now that they're getting, that he's out? I, I don't understand it. Is it a money thing? Is it a, a, you know, to make yourself look big? Or is it the truth? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to ask. You Did you ever question Jack over it? Did you ever think to yourself that he'd done it? I would know. We done everything together. I would know. If Jack went there to, you know, to a, uh, a scene like that, um, is he going to take a, f you know, a bunch of mates? You know. So was what was it? Nichols says to get them. What was it? He says that he'd picked them up. He'd picked them up, dropped them off, and then they went and killed the three of them. Yeah, Mick it was. And Jack. That's what he said. He, you know, he he dropped them off. They'd done the dirty deed, and then he picked them up. What was Max alibi? Uh, Mick was, I think, Mick was, I forget where he was. He was, well, Mick lives in Essex anyway, so he was somewhere in Essex. Mm -hmm. I forget where his alibi was, Mick's. But it didn't, you know, it, it didn't, none of it, they tried to link it to telephone evidence, telephone masks. But um, there was a telephone expert um, who we had on the trial um, who the police have used ever since our trial because he was that good and still use him to this day. Mm -hmm. He's, he was used on the Holly and Jessica murders up in Cambridge. You know, the two young girls? Yeah, Manchester. Uh, uh, Soham, yeah, Soham, Cambridge. Yeah. Because he knew them telephones never left 
there. He gave the evidence in that trial against um, Ian Huntley, you know, mm -hmm. and Maxine Carr. That was their, they, they got convicted on that. That was our telephone expert that the police use today. He says, Nick, in the old Bailey, Nichols was lying and still says it to this day. That man still rings my mother to this day. And that's a, that's a specialist, but they're using. Yeah. And that wasn't even enough to no. get them off with it. You, you know, we've had that one go back to the uh, appeal court, the telephone evidence and the rest of it, but they have ways of, you know, saying words to explain different things so that, you know, you could say, is this right? And they, they would do it mm -hmm. a different way. It is, is Mick still in? Yeah, Mick still in. How hard is it for both men who plead their innocence to then be losing family members and friends while in prison, knowing that you're innocent? Cool, I should have made it even harder for them in there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Did the struggle, did, was your dad still around? Did he, he passed he, away? When yeah, my, my dad... Um, when, John, uh, when Jack was in? Yeah, he got cancer. Dad's been dead about nine years now, but he got cancer. Never knew yet. And, you know, he was, time he was told he got cancer, he was dead within two weeks. But he went to the jail to see Jack um, the week before he died and said to my brother, um, Jack, just admit it, get home and look after your mother. You know, just just admit it. You get out. And my brother said, I ain't admitting to something I've never done. You know, which was a oh, terrible emotional roller coaster for them both. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, there's no way that Jack was going to admit for something he didn't do. When would they have got out if they admitted that? If they'd admitted it in the beginning, they might have let the 15 years go, I reckon, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. You know, the first parole date. Instead of altering it. It's scary that people have the power to take away people's lives. Yeah, they have, yeah. So it could it happen to any of us, couldn't it? Yeah. You know? Did you ever worry for yourself to be fighting for your brother's freedom that somebody could have took you away, but, killed you, or put you to prison yourself? Um, the, 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 the reversal side of it, no, there was not a problem there because Jack never done it in my mind, so there was never going to be a reversal side. Mm -hmm. um, the police and authorities side, yes, they monitored me three to six months surveillance me I never knew until I tumbled them in the end um, and you don't know what they could do you know it's it's a funny thing but you learn to uh, look at every junction you learn to look behind go round and round about twice that's what I used to do and to fact I'd still do a bit today you know, yeah. because you just don't know. If I can set them up, they could set you up or me. Yeah, just keep on your toes at all times. I think there's nothing wrong with a bit of paranoia, but as long as it's yeah. not breaking you down. Yeah. How's your mum feel that Jack's home? Oh, she's over the moon. My mum's well into her mid-80s now, so for her to survive COVID, you know, it's not that she's had it, but mm -hmm. the chance she could have had it and yeah, been one of the 60, um, yeah. sad people that we've lost, mm -hmm. um, she could have been one, you know, and, and to have her a boy home for the rest of her life well, for however long it'll be she's obviously over the moon do you think that's one of the reasons why she kept fighting kept hanging on yeah kept her alive yeah. to keep yeah. your brother keep fighting as yeah. well it's a f sad it is sad affairs that if it does go overturned how yeah. two men has lost their lives for over 20 years for murders yeah. that didn't commit but that means there's a murderer on the loose or maybe dead if um, yeah. Steve's right then it's just never ending with this, though. Yeah. It's always getting brought back up, and it must be hard for so many different people. Yeah. So it's, it's, but you've got to fight your case. You've got to fight for yeah. your brother's freedom now that he's out, but you still want it overturned. And it is scary to think that. The trouble you have and all, you know, I ask myself, you know, with the protests, you know, I was, like I said, I've done the gantry, the home office. I took skeletons in a wardrobe to the Crown Prosecution Service because I said they've got all them stunts that are done. You know, but I never got the more publicity after 2009. I put on the front, I, when I used to go to the appeal court or the high court, I put my banners all the way along that court, all the way along. And I could put what I wanted on them. But in 2009, we had a hearing there, I put on there two police officers' name, and the case to that date had cost 10.5 million. It's over 11 and a half million now. But at that particular time, 10.5 million of taxpayers' money. But two police officers' names up in there. I've never had publicity from that day onwards. Yeah. No newspaper touched me. 
Yeah. Come near me. Yeah, you can. Because I put two names. Yeah, they don't want to be seen that because if anything ever happens to them as well, then. When I was on the gantry, they only showed Jack Wombs and Michael Steele was innocent and never put corrupt police. You never see that on the telly. Yeah. You can't do it. Nah, that But you learn them things. Riots. But what, 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 when I've done them, you know, later on, down 20 years down the line, um, even though I made it a high profile case, and you're making it bigger than bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to a decision in them courts, that has got to be so precise because it's such a high profile case. So all them judges, all them have got to make the Z accurate, perfect decision. Do you think that can go against you sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Did I fuck up doing a pro protesting? Nah, because what happens is noise creates awareness also because if you don't say anything, then... They just rest. They're just basically dying yeah. in jail as well. So yeah. there's no really any right or wrong way to yeah. do it. You just want to keep their name alive and for people to keep looking into it. Mm. But if you've never done anything, if you weren't here, because I know Johnny Steele, who done the same for Joe Steele, they used to let, glue themselves to the prison gates and mm. um, just to keep creating awareness yeah. towards their case. And eventually they did get out, but they'd spent over 20 years in prison. And that's what I used to think about the books and the films and that, you know, it, it, it you know, even though when it came out, most of it was shit or made up, um, but it still kept the case alive, you know? It was doing half my job for me, mm -hmm. really. Even, you know, some of think, oh, what a load of shit in that. But it got publicity. Yeah, it made the case even bigger. Yeah, so yeah. you got to, you got to go along with it um, until they turn on you. Yeah, you've got to take it good with the bad. Mm. John, would you like to finish up on anything? No worries, John. Listen, thanks for coming on today and telling your story. And good luck with uh, Jack. Hopefully they get the, the fair trial that they deserve and everything gets overturned. Anything yeah. I can help with for the future, you've got my number, just give me a call and we can take it from there. But I appreciate it. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right. And be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.